Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, depending on where in the world you're joining us from. Welcome to our expert panel, Analytics for All, Democratizing Your Data with NAI, brought to you by our friends at Alteryx and Astronomer. I'm Brian Mink, co-founder and president of Data Science Connect, the world's largest data and AI community. Today, we're excited to welcome hundreds of attendees from all over the world to discuss how Gen AI is transforming data democratization by making advanced analytics accessible to every member of an organization, regardless of their technical expertise. Today, we'll discuss how to leverage Gen AI tools to empower your team with the ability to analyze and interpret data, fostering a culture of data-driven decision-making and innovation across your enterprise. We'll also talk about how leading organizations are dealing with new challenges around this technology, like data access, equality and governance, and data privacy. We're honored to hear from a distinguished panel of experts today. Peter Martinez, Product Marketing Director at Alteryx, Supriya Basha, VP and Head of Data Science at Advanced Analytics at BBDO, Morali Venkataraman, Executive Director of Systems R&D Leadership at Light and & Wonder, and Dr. Francis Boykin, Director of Advanced Analytics at at and Before we begin, a few housekeeping items. To make this feel a little more in person, we suggest you add a photo to your profile and include your bio, LinkedIn profile, and other information you want your fellow attendees to see. Next, please take advantage of the Q&A and chat features throughout the talk. We'll be dedicating a portion at the end to Q&A, so be sure to upload the questions you'd like the panel to address. If you're wondering where your organization stands compared to others on your AI journey, check out the poll question in the right sidebar. And finally, to learn more about how to leverage Gen AI for data democratization, Check out the calls to action below throughout the webinar from our sponsors, Alteryx and Astronomer. Now, without further ado, let's kick off our panel. Um, my name is Peter Martinez, and I'm the Product Marketing Director of Cloud Analytics and AI at Alteryx. If you're unfamiliar with Alteryx, I'll just tell you a bit about us. We're on a mission to empower all employees to make faster, more insightful, and more confident decisions with data, regardless of their technical skill level. And we do this with our low-code, no-code platform to support every step of the analytics journey. And lastly, um, just a little bit more about me. I've worked in the data and analytics space for about 10 years, and I've held roles as an analyst, as a technical consultant, as a strategy consultant, and as a product marketer as well during that time. Excellent. Morali. Great. Thank you, Brian. <clears throat> Hello, everyone. I'm Morali Mukatraman, Executive Director of Systems R&D. I have over 25 years of experience in software development, information, and uh, management, of course. Of course, I started uh, when I was five years old. <laughs> uh, currently uh, leading the data solutions team, uh, building awesome machine learning models, and looking forward to a very interesting conversation here. Excellent. Priya. Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. My name is Supriya, and I lead data science and analytics at a media and advertising company called BBDO. It's an Omnicom company. And with 18 years of experience in data, I have had privilege to uh, lead the projects and create, which created revenue streams and saved money using data science and analytics. Although we are into creative business, that is advertising, uh, but we bring science into everything that we do. And my core responsibility is to make sure that strategists who are working on creatives have the insights on clients before they even get onto the uh, whiteboard. And this closely aligns to today's topic, which is analytics for all. And I'm excited to share my insights and engage in this important conversation. Thank you. Thanks, Supriya. Welcome. I want to jump into our first question, um, which is how do you define data democratization and why is it more critical now than ever? Um, so why don't we start with you, Supriya? Give us your thoughts on that one. Certainly, and uh, such a great question, and I'm trying to turn on my camera. Okay, I'm here. Uh, so in layman's term, data dem democratization means making data accessible to everyone in an organization, and not just the IT department or data specialist. Um, to me, it may, I make sure that any employee, regardless of their technical skills, can access, understand, and use data to make informed decisions. And think of everyone giving in the company the same chance to use that important information. And why it is critical, especially now, world is moving faster and decisions are made even quicker ever before. Um, therefore, access to valuable data can help accelerate decision making, improve customer response, ultimately giving companies a competitive edge. Great point, Supriya. Uh, Peter, do you want to take us next? 
Yeah, yeah, I'd be happy to um, agree with with everything that Supriya said. I think that data democratization is really just about making analytics more accessible and also more approachable for people who just may not be subject matter experts in data. And I think that what makes data and analytics so exciting is that it's really a part of everything that we do. And um, it's just simply impossible to look at an area of the business without data-driven activities and to separate that out as something completely separate. So that's why you know the demand for analytics is at an all-time high. And um, that doesn't mean that everybody needs a PhD in data science. That's where data democratization comes in. It's about scale. It's about empowering knowledge workers to perform certain analytical tasks without having to submit a ticket or wait for a data science team that might be at capacity because they're working on more complex, larger projects for the organization. Yeah, great points. And and we have all these incredible technologies at our disposal now. And so there's uh, a lot of questions about how do you push that out to more broad than just the data and IT teams? What are the things that you need to put in place uh, to make that accessible to more people? So great points, Peter. Morali, why don't you take next? Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, thanks, Peter and Supriya. Uh, <clears throat> let me take you back to 1997, right, to give you an analogy. Now, I was working as a MIS engineer at uh, India at the time when I first got access to the internet. Suddenly, I could connect to uh, anybody around uh, the world and access any information by click of a button. That was mind blowing, right? But what is important is that sparked a flood of innovation ideas, right, for my team and myself. Some turned into great products, while others didn't quite make it. But the intuition here is democratizing the internet at that time uh, triggered innovation. And you know what happened, right? Uh, the dot com, dot net com boom, web, IoT, AML. Now bring that into your organization now. Imagine the data like an internet within your organization, right? So basically, in simple terms, data democratization is making this transform data a universal, accessible utility to everyone in your organization, right? Why is this so critical now? <laughs> like uh, Supriya and Peter said, right? We are now swimming in an ocean of data. We collect data from IoT devices, application, user behaviors, patterns, usage patterns, structured, unstructured. Every organization is collecting ocean of data. So in order to make a quick, smart decision, uh, we need to develop a culture of curiosity and everyone needs access to this data, right? It isn't just about making data accessible, it's about uh, transforming your organization into a place where uh, the innovation and data-driven decisions are uh, part of your DNA. Great points and great points about the transforming your culture and, and making data a part of your organizational DNA. Um, it's not enough to just roll these things out and say, here's some technology, play with it. You have to be able to do something with it that actually impacts the bottom line of the business. Uh, so that tees up our next question really nicely, which is uh, what are some of the biggest challenges that organizations are going to face when democratizing uh, data access and how can they overcome these obstacles? Obviously, if you've had a certain subset of data or IT folks who've sort of been the owners of your data, who are very well versed in some of these more technical issues and in some of the uh, benefits, but also challenges associated with using data. And now you're rolling that out to folks who maybe don't have that training and expertise and, and literacy. Um, that's going to come with some challenges. So what are uh, some of those challenges as, as you guys see it? And why don't we start this one with Peter? Yeah, absolutely, Brian. I think, um, as as you noted, there there are a litany of challenges. Um, I'll just call out one in particular that that we see quite often, which is addressing skills gaps. And I saw this as a consultant. I've seen it um, working at Alteryx as well with our customers. But in reality, there are many knowledge workers who simply just don't have the time or the capacity to learn um, skills with steep learning curves like coding or software development. And they shouldn't need to, right? Because for a lot of knowledge workers, their work doesn't just revolve around data, it revolves around other functional areas of a business or an organization. So, um, you know, with modern tools like low code, no code solutions, knowledge workers can quickly ramp up and they can perform necessary analytical tasks. Simple things like blending, 
preparing or transforming data much quicker than they might have needed to in the past. Um, artificial intelligence is another solution here, I think. Um, it can also play a role here and not just generative AI, but AI more broadly. I mean, for example, traditional machine learning and artificial intelligence can be baked into products to accelerate analysis or to surface and explain quantitative insights for people um, in terms and language they can understand. So th those that's just one of the biggest challenges that we see and, and, and some of the example solutions that we see as well. Yeah, great points, Peter. So Priya, why don't you take the next one? What are some challenges that you're seeing? Right, um, and I am really um, acknowledge what uh, Peter shared here. And apart from the data skills, um, there is no one challenge, and it actually depends on where your organization is in the data lifecycle. So, if you your company is just starting in the data lifecycle, you know, and uh, just I'll say taking baby steps, uh, probably technical infrastructure is a problem. You don't know where to start, what platforms to get to your company, um, and then another. And if you mature a little bit more, then uh, uh, is your are your functions and the data from different functions are integrated or are they operating in data silos? So there are different, uh, depending on where you are in the data life cycle, you need different solution. But to me and what I have observed is that infrastructure is a key, I'll say, starting point. And we do need a scalable solution. And these days in market, the great news is that there are so many uh, platforms available and mostly are subscription or user-based platforms. So depending on how much usage you have in the organization, you can choose your own subscription. Um, for resolving the data silos, I think making sure that you are consolidating data from various sources, say marketing, supply chain, or uh, uh, your media, uh, you're consolidating it into one accessible repository. We also call it data lake or data warehouse, and that becomes pertinent. So these are my top two challenges uh, on data democratization. Yeah, great points about infrastructure really being key to, to how you roll all this out um, and thinking through, you know, what what are the the other changes that you need to be making besides just, okay, we need to make this, put this data in folks' hands. It's like, what are the other things like our various different data silos that we need to be pulling together to even uh, make this, to, to really give this value for us. Uh, Morali, what's your take? Thank you, great points, uh, Supriya and Peter. First off, I want to make it very clear, uh, data democratization isn't a one and done uh, deal, right? Uh, it is a journey. Uh, it's basically transforming your organization from your current state to the future proof state. The major challenges uh, I see in our organization and in our work is primarily like Supriya mentioned, establishing the pipeline, making sure uh, the data literacy is across uh, the organization. And uh, being in a gaming industry, data privacy is very, very important. We are globally present. Right, the GDPR, PII, every country has got its own uh, privacy uh, regulations that we need to take care of it. And also analytic tools, uh, you know, uh, we need to make sure we collect information, structured, unstructured, everything to a data. But when you translate that into a data visualizations, uh, meeting for each and every business unit, so that is where the challenge comes, right? So how do we tackle this, right? I mean, I'm going to put some general thoughts on how to tackle because of the uh, variety of uh, folks may be attending from different industry here, right? The first you've got to start figuring out where the organization is in the data democratization maturity level, right? So very simple, without getting into details on the levels, you just see if your data is stuck in the silos, right? only accessible to a few departments, every department using their own data, right? So then you got to start there, basically defining the process and making sure the decisions are not made on that feeling. It needs to bring in some practices and try to bring them centralized. And 
that's super attached to that, right? Setting up the infrastructure and getting everything, bring the data into the centralized one. And again, you may be in the next stage with the centralized data, but restricted to specific roles. So how to tackle that here? The goal here would be uh, to define uh, data governance frameworks, right? Obviously, data governance also boosted data quality. Uh, Peter and Supriya talked about it that little bit as well in a different flavor. So once you have this standardized management processes across the hand, then enhance and making sure that data literacy is among your stuff, right? Uh, remember, the organizations must continuously evolve, right? Like I said, it is a journey. It depends on your size, product mix, maturity in uh, data collection, and, uh, you know, tackle the challenges, uh, go step by step, establishing standards, governance, and making sure keep pushing until you become fully data-driven, taking decisions on the data-driven, not gut feeling. So that's uh, my two cents here. Yeah, great points about just having a framework, having a step-by-step -step process, things that are important to follow uh, when when taking on these initiatives. I'm going to go ahead and jump to the to the next question. Great points on the the challenges uh, that organizations face when democratizing data access. Um, but now I want to talk about more of the positives, the things that are uh, really the most potential and the things that are most exciting about uh, data democratization, particularly as, as it relates to how NAI uh, can influence data democratization and, and further it. Um, so can you guys share some examples of how you've seen NAI specifically being used to enhance data accessibility, collaboration, data democratization across the organization? Uh, why don't we start with you, Morali? Absolutely. Um, <clears throat> imagine you are working at a company, right? Where getting data insight is as easy as a ch chatting with a colleague. You are a marketing guy or uh, some other financial guy. I want to know how much I made in the last three quarters. Just type in conversation. You don't have to be an expert. And then if you come, so Jenny can help you with those type of conversational type of thing, right? Providing insights with the demo. It is a game changer. And uh, every company, even everyone here, you will, you know, already you maybe start using that and your organizations are transforming now. I love the Uber use case in the real world, right? Uber's Michelangelo platform. Uh, if you have heard of it, uh, I strongly suggest go on read that predictive to generative article they have in their sites, right? Michelangelo is the heart of their AI operations. It helps teams across Uber to access high quality data and collaborate more effectively providing real time insights, right? And automating complex data sets. Not only that, they use a genuine tool called drag and crawl. That's an interesting tool because uh, it automates the mobile app testing, drag and uh, crawl can simulate user interactions, test app functionalities across different scenarios. And most importantly, right, you will love it. It resolves issues autonomously. That's, uh, that's the power of tools and uh, now, right? So I can keep on going Spotify uses. Not only think about within your organization, I would say, uh, think about the entire ecosystem around your organization, the stakeholders, internal and external. Spotify uses Genie to uh, personalize playlist. Walmart uh, use Genie to streamline their supply chain. Unilever uh, use Genie for market analysis. The Airbnb enhance customer experience. Stitch Fix. So I can keep on going, right? So one thing is, it is not about having data. It is about making data works for you seamlessly and efficiently. Absolutely. Uh, Francis, are you able to hear? I have audio now. All right, we're going to pick up with Peter and we'll come back to Francis. I think we're, we're getting close. Um, so, Peter, tell us about some of the most uh, exciting uh, use cases you're seeing around uh, Gen AI enhancing data accessibility and collaboration. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'll, I'll build on this notion that Morali just laid out, which is that um, 
generative AI just excels at specific tasks that have totally changed the game when it comes to analytics. And I think one of the best examples here is natural language interfaces. And so when I think about one of the biggest value propositions of generative AI, I think about what a natural language interface can do for your analytics environment. And what that means is just the ability to simply type instructions into a chat window and kick off a task. So um, we've really thought long and hard about this at Alteryx, and we've seen tr some tremendous value with this. Um, so for example, we've created a use case assistant called Playbooks in one of our products. And this um, use case assistant can recommend and prototype uh, build high value use cases for anyone. And all the user has to do is type in their role, their function, their industry, or their company as context. And Playbooks will generate use cases and actually even build out a proof of concept for them. So this is something that before generative AI, this, this was a long back and forth conversation between you know, somebody in the business and um, an analytics or data team. And it would take weeks to even get to a prototype or use case solutioning or all that. Um, you can really expedite it quickly with the help of, of generative AI. Um, we're also building a co-pilot that can help uh, non-technical users transform, prep, and blend data in an enterprise-grade analytics platform, which makes analytics even easier for non-experts to execute. So when you think about, you know, hey, maybe 30 years ago, if you wanted to join two tables, you had to uh, no SQL, right? And you had to write the correct SQL syntax to be able to join your tables and blend your finance data with your sales data. Um, fast forward to, to you know maybe a decade ago or so, or a little bit longer, uh, you see the rise of low code tools, no code tools, drag and drop tools where, hey, you don't have to know how to code. Uh, you just have to understand the logic of what you want to do and um, and learn some some basic GUI steps, right? Um, well, now we're in a world where you can actually just start to type that into a chat window and say, hey, um, Copilot, I want to join my sales um, table and my um, finance table, and I want these columns returned back to me. And um, and, and we're there, right? So um, it's it's incredible, and it's really, um, it's really just quite a game changer when it comes to the accessibility of analytics for, for folks who, who may not be technical experts. Yeah, great points. I hadn't heard the concept of a playbook before, but I think it's a it's a great one. And in particular, in uh, I think a lot of people's fear in in data democratization and in spreading these technologies throughout the enterprise is that uh, folks are going to go rogue, or people who don't have proper training or literacy are going to do things that uh, are not best practices or things that would be encouraged by the organization. And so I think by giving playbooks, by saying here, look, here are the use cases we've already. We've already done what needs to be done, basically, and you're just here sort of deploying it as you need it for your business cases. Uh, I think that's a, a great way to deal with that problem and and uh, give people the, the power of these tools without necessarily unleashing um, all the chaos that can sometimes come along with it. Um, Supriya, what are your thoughts? Oh. Well, uh when you ask this question, I'm reminded of NVIDIA's uh, CEO, Jensen Huang's quote that create com uh, computing technology such that nobody has to program. And I believe that ability to access the data without having to learn SQL coding or any other programming language is a major takeaway for me, especially when it comes to Gen AI. Um, Peter has touched upon some great examples. So has Murli. Um, you know, even um, the customer relationships have improved where problem solving is more self-serving with more efficient chatbots in place these days. Um, even result time has gone down for customer reps with Gen AI, you know, available to them at fingertips. So this is just one example that I'm taking. And there are se se several examples available where Gen AI examples have been used. I personally have witnessed Gen AI used for collab on code generation um, or QA and testing where tools like GitHub, Copilot, Peter touched upon it, which is powered by OpenAI's Codex, or Duet AI, that's a Google version of Copilot where you can just write a text prompt and you don't need to select or join tables, but uh, you just have to tell the 
platform that, hey, I want to see these two tables come together and give me sales data or marketing data or media data. So that has helped to, you know, that's the level of uh, transformation that now we are seeing. And uh, so, so yeah, I mean, Gen AI has really changed the way, changed the game altogether. Great point, Supriya. Uh, the next question, and, and we just got a question in the chat about this as well, um, is how do you balance privacy and security with the democratization? I think that's one of the, the biggest challenges that organizations are going to face um, when you're allowing new people to have access to different data and you're uh, allowing departments like marketing, for instance, to have access to data that maybe they didn't have before. Um, there are some very real compliance concerns around that. There are some concerns about potential breaches, um, potential misuse of the data. So, and and also just making it accessible to more people um, increases your cybersecurity risk. So um, what are what are your thoughts on the on those issues and how do you see organizations dealing with those? And we'll start with you, Supriya. Certainly, and I think nothing comes free. Uh, there are consequences of Gen AI and especially around data privacy. We have been hearing a lot around that. And uh, there are a few things that an organization can do to ensure that we have a, a proper quality and governance going on. So number one is that establishing if you have uh, data in your for, in your company and you have a platform somewhere you know even if it is you're starting off uh, uh, having establishing a data governance policies is pertinent start because you will not reach you know you will not create like a hundred person policy it's error and um, you know trial and error so keep keep improvising is what I will say when it comes to data governance policies but do start Another thing is uh, establishing access controls and security measures like role-based access control. And that comes uh, with cloud, you know, if you have cloud environment. Um, so making sure that when somebody in ID or in your uh, uh, you know, data team have uh, the ownership of controlling that access control. Um, I have also seen that these days companies are investing a lot in creating literacy and awareness program. Uh, for data governance policy. So making sure that even when you know uh, someone joins, uh, even before someone logs into their system, they have the mandatory trainings going on as to what those important things uh, to understand and how to catch those uh, uh, areas where you know something goofy is going on. Uh, another thing is that, and of course, IT department or your data department cannot just you know do everything. So having Every function where we are touching on the data or taking data from there, uh, have data stewards. Make sure that there is someone in your in the function who is the owner and has a neck on the line to make sure that you know we are uh, following all the data governance policies uh, and you know nobody is using it uh, for their own benefits but for company's benefit. Yeah, great points about data governance. Who has access to what? When do they get access to it? How long do they have access to it? For what purposes can they use that data? Uh, how is that data going to be stored, protected? All of those things. Um, very critical when you're figuring out uh, the strategy around how to de-risk uh, data democratization. Uh, Peter, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I think Supriya made some just great points. I agree with everything that she said. Um, I'll bring some additional context here. I think when it comes to um, policies and um, procedures that are in place when it comes to governance are huge. Um, and those should be cross-functional, right? I think that's that's one of the biggest takeaways with where we are today is those should involve people from across the business. Uh, you should be talking to legal counterparts, but you should also be talking to you know business leads and sales and, and other areas, right? Analytics professionals should definitely be involved in that. Like bring different perspectives to the table and um, and create the policies that, that adhere to your business and, and, and that are gonna move your business in the direction that, that you want to move it. Um, I also agree with the points about role-based access controls. Um, you know, there's, there's a lot that you can do when it comes to governance from a technical standpoint, but then there's also just a lot that needs to be done from more of a people and process standpoint as well and a policy standpoint. So it really is a holistic solution. Um, when it comes to data quality, you know, I think that, um, more than anything, it just really elevates the importance of prep, blend, and transformation work and building sort of that foundation 
of data quality upon which you can, um, you know, start to programmatically use more AI in your business. Um, you know, all of the data processing work that needs to happen to make data fit for analytics use just becomes even more important uh, to get right. And with this in mind, I think it's super important. Again, we talk about, you know, there's a question in here about the intersection of, of data, democra data, data democracy and AI. I think it comes into this question as well here. Um, when you could adopt data prep solutions that are infused with AI that can make analytics more approachable and accessible for people, um, those can be some of the tools in your tool belt to help ensure that data quality is um, is coming out correctly, to help ensure that that governance processes are being followed. So um, I do think it all it all ties together for an enterprise. Yeah, great points, Peter. Morali, what are your thoughts? Always it is challenging to, to respond after Supriya and Peter covers all the key points, right? I totally agree with what they covered. But uh, the question, uh, there is a slight uh, uh, color I want to add to what they said, right? So how do we ensure data quality and governance? First of all, if data is widely accessible, uh, with uh, strong security measures that they talked about, right? Uh, the organization is already uh, quantitatively, if I can kind of term, matured, right? So employees are data savvy and integrate analytics into their daily operations. So quality and governance uh, go hand in hand here. Right? So in our case, we have advanced governance that automatically ensures the data quality and compliance being in the gaming industry. So advanced governance is very important, right? So what I mean by that, we establish very detailed governance policies to manage quality, security, and compliance, right? They define a very clear standards on how we collect data, how we bake uh, security in each and every stages of the data pipeline before it hits a data lake, storage, what are all the governance and standards needed to store the data, governance around usage across the organization. So the governance is very, very important that takes care of the data quality, right? And like uh, Supriya and uh, Peter said, right? Everything needs to be authenticated and authorized, any access authentication, um, authorizations, you can create group policies and assign those group policies to the individual teams. So that will dictate what level of data, what type of data they can access, type of thing, right? So depending on their roles only, they can get access to the relevant data. That's very, very important, right? And of course, we use a lot of monitoring tools, uh, uh, continuous monitoring tools. Those tools basically provide uh, indicators whether there, there are any inaccuracies or inconsistency or uh, integrities if it deducts anomaly deductions are there at least, right? So those are all basically automated validation checks are done because it is important at every stage these validation and uh, 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 integrity checks need to happen. You don't have to wait until the back end where the, all the data is collected and then do that right so that continuous uh, monitoring is important and not only monitoring actionable feedback loop is important here right we also use a lot of tools even from machine learning uh gen ai related stuff or machine learning whatever it is right uh, the, even the ai side of it we use a data robo platform which automatically allows us to build models and takes care of automate a lot of other stuff right and uh, already I talked about the privacy be, being in the gaming industry, uh, GDPR, CCPA, uh, and every jurisdiction, the uh, regulations are pretty tight. And um, more, most important also continuous uh, training is in, in needed to educate the employees about the data governance. Training is very, very critical. It is not having a standards or advanced governance in place or practices defined, but continuous education. Everyone in the organization need to understand why they are supposed to do certain things, why they are not supposed to do certain other things type of thing, right? And also we very much focus on predictive, not only predictive, but prescriptive analytics using generic. So what is prescriptive, you may know, right? It suggests action and uh, uh, help uh, 
uh, achieve the desired outcomes, right? It combines not only just data, but algorithms and machine learning. Everything goes hand in hand to provide a prescriptive analytics. I'll keep on talking, so I will stop here. <laughs> no, great points, Morali. I think one, one thing that I really took from that was leveraging platforms to automate a lot of this work for you, a lot of the repetitive work or things that are critical to your ongoing data governance as you roll out data democratization across your organization, um, figuring out how do we, not only how do we do this at a point in time, but how do we keep our data high quality? How do we ensure that we have governance across our organization, that we have these policies that are consistently uh, implemented and nothing's falling through the cracks and, and some technological solutions are, are one really great way to ensure that that's happening and that it's more automated. Uh, I want to jump now to some question, a question that we're seeing in the in the chat. I've got a, a couple of different questions that are sort of touching on this, which is um, where did data democratization and Gen AI merge? In what way is uh, Gen AI really a, a seismic shift in terms of data democratization and enabling fundamentally new things that were maybe not possible before or not possible at the same scale or at the same level of quality? And to what extent is it just one new technology among many others um, that's that's part of the data and tech stack for um, various organizations. So, so where do you see Gen AI as potentially a, a seismic shift for data democratization? Uh, Peter, why don't we start with you? Yeah, no, totally. Um, I, it's a good, great, great question. And I think really what it comes down to is that um, AI and machine learning and, and particularly generative AI they lower the barrier to adoption for analytics. And that's huge because if you think about analytics historically, um, so much of the challenge with analytics has been in barriers to adoption, like, like um, having to be an expert or having to be you know, super proficient in a coding language like SQL or Python or R. Um, so just as we move forward, I think you'll see a lot of innovation um, that is going to bring the barrier to adoption down for analytics. And my hope is that this will just empower more people to be data driven and to explore and try data analytics projects across organizations without feeling like they need the help of an expert. Um, and, and don't get me wrong, there will always be a need for data and analytics experts. That's not going to go away, um, but there will never be enough of them to service all of the needs of a data driven business, right? And I think AI and machine learning can really help to create this future. Um, and I'm excited about it because I think analytics is fun, I think it's interesting. Um, and I think the 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 best people uh, to do analytics in the business are often the people that know the most about their functional area. And so that's a big value proposition here again from AI and machine learning is that by lowering the barrier to adoption, you can push analytics out to the people who know the most about sales or know the most about um, you know human resources and know that data. And now they can actually interact with it. they can they can use it, they can model it. Um, with the help of of AI driven assistance. Yeah, uh, really, really great points, Peter. And I think the lowering the cost of various use cases, I think, is a really critical one. Which is, if you if you don't have to hire a data science team to to do every use case, you know, now there are a whole lot of use cases that are possible that maybe were not worth it before. Um, if you're able to democratize it to people who already uh, are working on something similar or who are closest to the use case. Uh, now there there are just things that you wouldn't have done as an organization because it was cost prohibitive to do it that now you can add a lot of value by doing through democratizing data, which is empowered through data democratization. We're all yeah. Yeah. Sorry, I was uh, briefly got disconnected. What was the question, uh, Brian? Uh, we were just talking about one of the questions that's been popping up in the chat is is to what extent is Gen AI really a seismic shift in terms of data democratization and empowering new use cases or new things that organizations previously couldn't do versus how is it just a, a natural evolution of many of the other things that uh, data science teams have been working on for years? Sure, yeah, absolutely. <clears throat> Even in our case, right? So we used to have... Uh, complete data solution team, data scientists who start with the traditional way of uh, analyzing the data, right? Now with the Gen A in place, 
the Gen AI tools can, uh, we can create assistance. Um, if you already, you may start hearing about, we are, we are in the next stage of chatbots, right? right? Chatbots are the legacy now. So we are now working on assistance and orchestrate assistance. So each of the assistant, you can define a role, you can task. Like for example, you want to do some data cleaning, you create an assistant. And then that assistant can do the data cleaning of your pipeline and hand over that uh, output to another assistant whose role may be defined as doing a exploratory data analysis type of thing, right? So that assistant can do that and then we'll give it back to Again, yet another assistant to determine what type of algorithm is better to use for it, right? So to put it simply without getting into the nitty gritty details, uh, now you can have Gen AI is so powerful, you can create the complete, you can multiple agents you can create for each and every role, not just the data scientist role or whatever it is, anything, whether it is a financial or whether you want a marketing department, everywhere you create for each of the roles, you can create agents. And then you can orchestrate data between the agents to get the final results. So that, uh, that that's the biggest advantage now, right? Now, the prescriptive which I talked about is basically it can come from the machine learning models, AI and other things. So they go hand in hand with each other. Yeah, great point. Agents are, I think, one of the most exciting Gen AI use cases for sure, and the ability to train personalized agents uh, on various tasks. Uh, really, really exciting, and I think high growth uh, area that we'll be seeing a lot of in the next few years. Um, Supriya, what are your thoughts on this topic? Uh, I think Peter and Murli has touched on most of the things I wanted to say. I'll only add that the line between AI and data demo democratization is disappearing. Uh, it's all about uh, you know making the AI available in a most user friendly way and uh, to all in the organization. So I think. Uh, I have nothing more to add uh, what Peter and Muli has already um, shared. Yeah, thanks for very great points. Um, I want to get back to a, uh, another question in the chat that's a good one as well, uh, is in terms of how the work environment is going to change. Um, so as we increasingly democratize data, as we make new tools available to folks who are not um, who are not data experts, they may be subject matter experts, or they may be in, on, on various different business teams. Um, how, how are their job functions going to change? How's the work environment going to change? Um, and, and we see this a lot right now with several organizations have announced that um, they are laying off certain segments of their workforce, but they're not necessarily contracting, they're hiring, um, like Intuit recently announced, you know, they're, they're laying off 1,800 people and hiring back 1,800 people to do different things. Um, so we may see an increase in that as organizations kind of reskill their workforces or reevaluate what kinds of talent they need in light of these new technologies. So, so how do you see organizations dealing with these human resource um, challenges or opportunities? Uh, and, and how do you see uh, different teams kind of growing as, as analytics are more democratized? And we'll start with you, Supriya. Certainly, and such a great question. And I have seen that in my workplace too, where um, I, I lead a team of data scientists and anal analysts. And uh, we see that now they every day um, our counterparts uh, who are more business people are have access to Gen AI. And then we sometimes, you know, my team members come back and say that, hey, are we becoming redundant? And my answer is no, we are not becoming redundant. Uh, yes, this is the most challenging time in the history of the world, I would say, because we are seeing such a major shift happening. Uh, even, you know, we can hear the market you know, changing, there are layoffs happening, then rehiring, which you covered, Brian. I think, uh, and this has happened in every era. You know, every new technology get introduced, we upskill ourselves and then get to back to work. So there was a, you know, introduction of cloud computing that came in. Yes, it was the major disruptor, but what happened? All we did was upskill ourselves, become a little more wiser as to how to use it and then apply it in our work. So similar is going to happen and is happening with Gen AI. Uh, we are upskilling opportunities are being um, available uh, by the organization or outside 
you so upskill yourself and then see that where you can uh you know bring in that value so so yeah that would be my takeaway absolutely uh morali what are your thoughts yeah, i totally agree with this supriya right so if you all remember um, <clears throat> long back when calculators were introduced right there were protests by mathematical teachers universities and students everybody right so they didn't realize at that time it's going to improve their quality it's the same thing happening now with the ai and everything it's not going to replace that it's going to improve the way how we work and it's going to trigger more and more innovations in my opinion creating more jobs uh, i can use uh, several examples right healthcare Uh, now nlp systems are helping doctors uh, to query patients uh, patient data instantly right and uh, they can diagnostics uh, significantly uh, to improve patient outcome so is it going to replace the doctor no but maybe if there are two doctor offices one effectively using and uh, giving the results and other office doesn't use the ai so that's where the difference is going to be right and the finance fraud deductions right so I, how many times we are keep hearing that it is hacked and we personal privacy information is gone but if we have a strong security system and fraud deduction systems and uh, using the ai that's going to protect our data that's going to help in that right and uh, you are seeing when i walk into the uh, any places right i bought one washing machine the next day i get an email on uh, uh, you know uh, other uh, accessories and everything in there so how they are able to do that all these recommendation systems to reach out right so like supriya said is it going to be so disruptive yes there are some roles that may be getting uh, impacted but there are more and more roles are going to come in right it may be a temporary phase some may be losing jobs but we are going to it's going to open up a, a completely new paradigm shift a lot of new roles and new opportunities are going to come and more and more innovations uh, we, we don't know in another 5 to 10 years we'll be living a completely different life absolutely it is a definitely an exciting time um some, some, sometimes a scary time but uh, i think in in more ways an exciting time around all the these technology so um great points morali peter what are your thoughts about the future of of gen ai and data democratization for the workforce Yeah, I think uh Morali and Sapria brought up some some great points. Um and I totally agree with uh with what they said. I think um you know, really good way to think about this is um you know, there will you, you might see some 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 job displacement like you mentioned Brian with with into it kind of shifting the strategy, but as Sapria and Morali pointed out, these tectonic shifts happen in 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 technology innovation all the time, right? And what op- often happens is reskilling, upskilling, you know, these just become part of the job. I think where we'll see the biggest impact is in the nature of work and how work gets done. So if we think about that from an analytics standpoint, um I think w- let's let's just look at like one little tiny piece of an analytics process like let's talk about prepping and blending and transforming data. Um maybe in that process or task you'll spend less time configuring tools um writing queries um you know building out pipelines manually you'll spend more time maybe reviewing the outputs um or you'll spend more time figuring out what the next pipeline should be to be built maybe when it comes to modeling you'll spend less time building the model you'll spend more time evaluating the model describing what it does explaining it to your business counterparts right exploring conversations talking about you know how it's performing um and 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 up leveling the data literacy of the people around you. So I think um the 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 biggest impact that we'll see here is is not necessarily in in sh- sort of shifting um labor percentages but you'll really just see a different type of work uh w- workplace e- evolving and you'll see a different a change in the nature of what your role is and and hopefully um what we're seeing a lot of innovation is 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 focusing on um sort of those more tedious or mundane tasks for um for for professionals whether that's in analytics or in other functional areas um and allowing their human creativity and ingenuity to 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 really thrive um and be more sort of front and center um throughout the work day. A great point and hopefully one that will um make the work experience better for a lot of people uh not work one that will eliminate some of these mundane repetitive tasks. Um So I want everybody to kind of look into your crystal ball now and and look ahead. 
to how we see the future of data democratization evolving in light of Gen AI. We've, we've talked about a lot of the immediate uh, concerns and opportunities, uh, some of the, the things that we might be looking at over the next maybe two to five years. But let's look even further and think maybe 10, 20 years in the future. Where do you see the, the future of Gen AI and data democratization evolving? Uh, what are some of the most exciting use cases that you see on the horizon or some of the things that you think we need to be cautious about? Um, we'll start with you, Morelli. Yeah, that's a, that's a great question, right? So there are a lot of AI, ML related advancements and Gen AI related stuff that I'm really fascinated with, right? But related to what I do, our work, a uh, few things I would like to highlight here. One is uh, AutoML. <laughs> uh, for example, the HTO.ai, if anyone has used, right? So they allow user to create, validate, and deploy machine learning models without needing deeper technical expertise. That are is another one, right? The, this capability basically to do the auto ML, right? So this democratizes the advanced analytics. Peter talked about a lot about analytics, right? So just imagine uh, I'm a HR person or a finance. If I can build a predictive model tailored to my need without technical expertise, how does that sound like? That's where the technology is going. A HR person or a finance person may be able to create I think we are already there. Uh, they can create their own model, just drag and drop objects, create more model, and then start uh, using the predictions and other thing. Okay, what, what is going to happen in the next three months? What, uh, what is the trend showing up based on the last five years? What are all the trends from the competitor company? Those type of things, they will be able to just put the files in a folder or everything publicly available information, or even uh, querying their own enterprise data sets by creating the model themselves without knowing what data science is, how to build models and everything. That's the auto ML, power of the auto ML going. Augmented analytics is another thing, right? Uh, so, which is uh, basically, uh, again, it touches the earlier question. Uh, this may reduce the need for a data scientist, uh, but Gartner uh, predicting that by 2025, augmented analytics will drive most of the new BI and analytics deployments, which is scary because we are talking about only months here, right, 2025. So data scientists need to evolve into the other technologies, not just the traditional data scientists routine task here, right? So that's something. Embedded AI, edge computing, everywhere it is IoT, right? It is a, uh, IoT proliferation everywhere. Edge computing is another one where there will be intelligence based on the AI at the edge, uh, the, where the IoT devices are itself to take decisions. It doesn't have to be a centralized, a large size prediction. A yeah, great point, Raleigh. Uh, Peter, what are your thoughts? Yeah, um, you know, I, I don't have a crystal ball, um, but I will try to, to think into the future and, and kind of think about what we might see. Um, I think we're definitely going to see a rise in more multimodal sort of interactions with AI. And so what I mean by that is, um, you know, today, a lot of what folks have done, at least interacting with, with generative is to interact with some kind of prompt based interface, most notably, probably chat GPT. Um, and that's typing, right? But I think what you'll start to see um, in the near future really is a rise of, you know, maybe voice based um, and that's already in existence today, but I think you'll see more and more of that, right? Or or AI systems that um, are are connecting to uh, you know call transcripts in real time, um, things things like things of that nature, right? So I think you're just going to see more and more multimodal, visual, those types of um, innovation when it when it comes to to, to AI and analytics. Um, I think this is going to make a lot of organizations have an honest look in the mirror about um, where they stand when it comes to data management. Um, AI is a and, and AI you know related initiatives are a great um, sort of um, you know target to drive towards. But in in my humble opinion and with the background of, of of being in analytics, like it's the top of the pyramid. Um, so many of these things that we've discussed today are the foundation of the pyramid. You need data quality. You need data management. 
you need process, you need, you need processes, policies, all those things to be, to be, um, underneath so that your AI is creating value for you. Right. Um, and so I think that from an enterprise level, you'll see, or I hope that we will see a much more of an emphasis on, um, some of those, um, you know, foundational elements of what good analytics needs, uh, moving forward, because that, that's not going to change. Right. Um, so those are just a, a couple of thoughts, um, I think, from 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 my side that that we'll probably see here um, in the near future. Yeah, I love the points about multimodal and and this expanding across lots of our, our lives and, and careers in lots of different ways that we may not even realize that we're using Gen AI, but it's it's built into the products and it's a seamless experience. Um, Supriya, what are your thoughts? I know we are on the top of the hour, but I'll leave with three trends, and uh, this is more of, I'll say, macro trends. Uh, number one is self-service, self-serving analytics, which means that making data access and analysis easier for everyone, even the non-tech people. And uh, that will allow users to query and integrate data effortlessly. Uh, my second one is a greater emphasis on data literacy, which means not only just at the workplace, but also even you will see it happening in school and colleges where there will be special coursework introduced and it's already happening, uh, but there'll be more, more emphasis on data related subjects or, you know, which becomes a, a part of their curriculum. And third would be uh, more laws and regulations around data governance. We already are seeing rise in those, but I think there will be more happening in that area where privacy, security, ethical guidelines, will be implemented to ensure that, you know, we are having responsible data usage and we protect the sensitive information. Yeah, great point, especially around education and literacy, as well as the regulations. I think we're gonna see uh, a lot more of those coming down the pike as, as folks start to get their arms around this and and uh, we start to understand a lot of the different ways that AI is gonna impact everything that that we do um, and, and data becomes more democratized. Um, we are out of time. So with that, I wanna thank our expert panel um, for joining us. This was a, a really great conversation. Um, thank you as well to all the folks who asked questions in the chat. Um, very, very good uh, insights and contributed to a, a very uh, interesting discussion. So thank you again for joining us. If you missed any of the webinar today or you want to rewatch anything, the recording will be available for uh, just a few minutes after the webinar concludes. If you refresh this page, should be at the same link. Uh, and I want to thank you again to our partners, uh, Alteryx and Astronomer, Astronomer, for making this webinar possible. And we'll see you all, see you all again next time. Thank you.